This is part two of Questioning Oshalan's Jewish Question by Chaya Heller. A note on terminology. Going forward, I'll utilise the term anti-Jewish racism rather than anti-Semitism. In 1879, German propagandist Wilhelm Marr coined the term anti-Semitism. Marr chose anti-Semitismus as the pridesome name for a pro-German social movement portrayed as protecting the pure German culture and bloodline from being degraded by Jewish people. Ma seized upon the term Semite, used by archaeologists and archaeolinguists, unknown to the general public, to create anti-Semitismus because it sounded more scholarly than its crude predecessor, Judenhass, Jew hate. Anti-Semitism allowed Ma to cast Jewish people as a fictional race of Semites that never existed, thus making European Jewish people appear inherently other as non-European. The term anti-Semitism is, I believe, both undignified and misleading. When Jewish people and allies utilise the term, they unintentionally reproduce a racist and typological thinking that others Jewish people, putting them in danger. Retiring terms like Semite, Semitic and anti-Semitism is, in my view, central to establishing a historically accurate and anti-racist understanding of Jewish history and identity. The term anti-Jewish racism shows racialized Jew hatred for what it is, a modern hatred of Jewish people that depicts them as a distinct and inferior race with a range of negative attributes. Subtitle. Question 1. How is Ocelin's universal Jew central to his notions of a Jewish ideology and a Jewish question? A first question is, why does Oshalan present Jewish people as a generalised, universal entity? The answer is that all forms of racism reduce complex and changing groups of people to homogenous and unchanging entities. Attributing timeless biological or cultural essences to particular groups is called racist essentialism. Just as US and anti-black racism condemns black people for sharing a universal essence that allegedly makes black people intellectually and morally inferior, anti-Jewish racism portrays Jewish people as sharing an essence that makes them inclined to amass financial, political and other forms of destructive power. Oshelin's interchangeable and often random terms for Jewish people present Jews as a universal and timeless category that can be described by using a limitless and even ahistorical set of reference. Oshelin isn't concerned with Jewish people's locations at specific historical junctions, geographies or ethnicities. He presents them as a unitary monolith that bounces across time, space and culture while retaining immutable qualities. Aside from one instance of using the historically meaningful terms Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews, Oshelan utilises ahistorical, universal and general terms such as Jews, the Jews, Jews of the East, Jews of the West, Judaism, Western Judaism, the Hebrews, the tribe of the Hebrews, Jewish ideology, Hebrew tribal ideology, Mosaic faith, Sabbatians, Sabbatianism, the Diaspora, Kingdom of Zion, Zion and Israel. Oshelin also categorises Jewish people simultaneously as a tribe, religion, ethnic group, nation and colonials. By referring to Jewish people as Judaism, Oshelin reduces a diverse ethnic group comprised of both religious and secular people to a religion. Oshelan's varied terminology turns the category of Jewish people into a confused, essentialized jumble. While the term Jews can be in many contexts an acceptable term for Jewish people, for the purposes of the text I'll use Jewish people to distinguish Oshelan's essentialized depiction of Jews from my attempt to portray a diverse and historically dynamic set of peoples. 
Appealing to an essentialized Jew, Oshelan portrays Jewish people as sharing a universal Jewish ideology that is so important that he must raise the Jewish question to solve it. The word ideology generally refers to a specific set of ideas and beliefs backed by powerful institutions such as nations, states, dominant religions, classes or castes. Ocelan's notion of Jewish ideology inaccurately establishes Jewish people as a universal entity able to act as a powerful state-like institution imposing Jewish ideas on the entire world. Yet, despite Ocelan's repeated statements about the importance of understanding the destructive Jewish ideology, he never defines the ideology's temporal, historical, cultural or theoretical features. And this is because Jewish ideology is a racist fiction rather than a historical fact. Jewish people as a collective entity are not a powerful institution commanding a unified ideology. Also, Jewish people across the centuries are simply too geographically, ethnically, religiously and politically diverse and dispersed to share even a common culture, national identity or world view. In addition to presenting a universal and essential Jewish ideology, Ocelan presents a universal Jew as the subject of the racist Jewish question associated with 19th century European nationalism. During a period of rising nation-building, Jew-hating political pundits like William Marr portrayed European Jewish people as racially non-European, thus deeming them incapable of ever being or becoming true Europeans. This is significant in light of the fact that by the 1800s, Jewish people had lived in Europe for well over a thousand years. During the 19th century, discussions of the Jewish question abounded as European political thinkers and politicians pondered what to do with Jewish people living in territories where true Europeans would embrace their modern national identity. Should Jewish people be physically relocated outside of Europe within colonial territories, such as in Africa, governed by various European countries? Should they be assimilated, expelled, confined to specific territories, or exterminated? By the end of World War II, Europe's burning Jewish question lost legitimacy after Hitler finally solved the question with his final solution – the factory-style murder of two-thirds of European Jewry. Ocelan situates his discussion of Jews within the dialectical tradition associated with Hegel and Marx. Ocelan's dialectic expands upon Marx's focus on the primary contradiction between the oppressed proletariat and the bourgeoisie to include a range of oppressed groups, including women and ethnic minorities, such as Jewish, Armenian, Assyrian and Kurdish people. Ocelan's dialectical approach grants agency to the oppressed, viewing marginalised people as often more than simple passive victims of history. For Ocelan, oppressed groups often righteously use their agency to resist their oppressors. Yet he sees other oppressed groups, like the Jews, as doing something different. These oppressed groups use their agency to collaborate with their oppressors at the expense of a greater humanity. Ocelan's Jews are not just victims of centuries of Jewish persecution, marginalisation and violence. They are a universal agent who historically collaborates with power. Ocelan's dialectical and agency-oriented approach to understanding Jewish history is invalid, however, because Jewish people are not a category analogous to race, class or gender. Jewish people represent a mere 0.2% of the global population, and spanning classes, races and nationalities, they do not possess collective Jewish interests. Despite this, Ocelan treats the Jews as a powerful class-like entity. He invokes a quote by Marx as he compares Jewish people to proletariat, able to liberate the world. Quote, I would like to close this theme by repeating something Karl Marx said, if the proletariat wants to liberate itself, it must proceed in the knowledge that this is not possible without liberating the world. I say that if Judaism wants to liberate itself, it must understand that to do so it must necessarily liberate the world. 
using its strategic, ideological and material resources to this end, which, above all, includes democratic modernity, end quote. Jews, however, cannot constitute the revolutionary subject. They lack the strategic, ideological and material resources, in Oshelin's words, and numbers, backed by institutionalised Jewish power to make or break the revolutionary project. All forms of oppression and hierarchy depend on institutionalised power. Wealthy people draw power from institutionalised capitalism, and men draw power from cis-hatriopatriarchy, but Jewish people don't draw power from institutionalised Jewish power, because institutionalised Jewish power does not exist. If a Jewish person or group collaborates with powerful oppressors to cause harm to members of any subjugated group, they don't draw their power from their Jewish identity. They draw power from racialized and class status gleaned from institutions of capitalism, cis patriarchy or white supremacy. This more complex field of power is collapsed by Oshelan's erroneous invocation of a universal Jew whose Jewishness enables them to collaborate with powerful institutions. Absent any identifiable global institutionalised system of Jewish supremacy over non-Jews, analogous to white supremacy or colonialism, Oshelan's theory of Jewish power falls apart. When Oshelan invokes a universal Jew or Jewish ideology as a form of institutionalised power, he enters invalid data into his dialectical theory of Jewish history. The conclusions he gleans from this theory of Jews are thus baseless. They are conspiratorial thinking dressed up as historical analysis.